Wow. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, we have some incredible talent in this church. And I know some of it is just people acting silly. <laughs> no, I'm serious. We, we have some people who can sing, who can teach, who can minister, who can bless us in so many ways. We are, we are very fortunate. God has blessed us. And I, that was the place where you're supposed to say amen. 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 Thank you. God has really blessed us. And, um, you know, I hope that this morning when you woke up in your homes, uh, that it was a joyous time. And that while I'm certain many of you exchanged gifts already and did some things, uh, uh, the very fact that you're here this morning um, to worship the Lord God on the celebration and, and, and memory of His birth, what, what a wonderful time. What a good thing. Well, as you know, we have been doing Advent now for the last five weeks. And we started several weeks ago. In fact, I believe it was the last Sunday in, uh, in November, if I recall. And one of the things that we did, we, loved, we lit this love candle. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the hope candle. The hope candle. And you know what? Uh, today we are celebrating a special occasion too in the in the lighting of the middle candle, which is the Jesus candle. But Jesus brings us hope like nothing else or no one else can do. Amen. I mean, we all have hope in many things that revolve around our lives and our families and so on. But Jesus brings us a hope that is way beyond what the world or people can bring us. And then if you recall the next one was the candle of peace. And once again, no one can offer peace to us as Jesus can. The peace that passes understanding. Peace when there can be no peace. Peace that goes beyond when the guns stop. Peace that goes beyond when the bombs stop. But an inner peace. And if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That was another place to say amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> and then the next one was the candle of joy. Joy is something that uh, is often hard to describe. I can think back to my children being born to my grandchildren being born and the joy that I felt, you know, and what a wonderful day it was. And I can remember, I, I have to say, Carlos, the day that I baptized you, it was a day of joy for me, particularly because I had known you for so long, and I was so excited that you were taking that step. And you know what I'm talking about. We, we have snippets of joy in our life, moments of joy in our life, but Jesus, offers a joy that goes way beyond anything that we could experience with anything else. And then, the candle that we lit last week was the candle of what? The candle of love. And once again, we experience many different kinds of love in our life. And I explained to you last week that, and, and I'm, I'm certain that I wasn't telling you anything you probably didn't already know, but in the New Testament, love is described in at least three ways with three Greek words. But whenever it's talking about Jesus and the church and God's love for us, it always uses the word agape, which means an unselfish, unconditional love that goes beyond and beyond where other love leaves off. Unconditional love. To think that we worship a God that loves us unconditionally. That means there's nothing we can do ever that will keep him from loving us. And that's and you know what? We can't say that 
about the things we experience here on earth because, you know, there are times we go through difficult problems and issues and things and, and our, our love gets a little strained, but not with God. God has promised to love us with an everlasting love. And then, of course, today, the Jesus count. The Jesus candle in which all the other candles find a place of unity, where he represents all of what God is to us. And I wanted to read the story that Luke shares about the birth of Christ. And then following that, we're going to participate in the Lord's Supper this morning. chapter 2, and by the way, don't, don't be confused or tricked. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes we tend to think of, of the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as four of the disciples or apostles of Christ. And that's not true. Luke was not an apostle of Christ. Luke was the doctor to who? He was the doctor to who? Paul. Paul. He was the Apostle Paul's doctor who traveled with him when he went to all of his mission trips and, and he took notes of all the testimonies and all the reports that he heard about Jesus. And he saw and heard things firsthand that Paul was saying and doing. And this book that is one of our Gospels, we... Um, uh, have it because Luke was writing a letter to his friend, Theophilus, explaining to him all about Jesus and all about the wondrous things that had happened with Jesus and, and, and in those days in Judea. And so we have this wonderful, quite detailed report of the life of Jesus and his ministry and all of the miracles and so much information that Dr. Luke has preserved for us in this letter that he's writing to his friend. Now just to go a step further, the book of Acts <coughs> was also written by Luke. It was his second letter to his friend Theophilus because he was writing Theophilus to report to him what was going on with the church, the body of Christ. So Luke has left us a great heritage of truth and information and history about the things of God that were taking place in those days. He records here in Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, Now it came about in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first sentence taken while Perilius was governor of Syria. And all were proceeding to register for the census, everyone to his own city. <coughs> and Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. And it came about that while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths. You know, I'll never get used to the new translation of cloths. I still say in my head, swaddling clothes, don't you? Amen. <laughs> and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. And in the same region, there were some shepherds, staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terribly frightened. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that shall be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths or swaddling clothes 
and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. And it came about, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then, and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came in haste, and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which they were told, to, which was told to them about the child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her in her heart. And the shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told. What a wonderful story that is. Amen. It pretty well says it all, doesn't it? Amen. That God prepared a woman to have the child, that he prepared a man to take care of her until the child was born. And I'm certain that on that trip to Bethlehem, God's hand was on them the whole trip, because that was a, a very difficult trip to have to make with a, a lady who was pregnant on a donkey. That's pretty tough. And then to get there, uh, they weren't able to check into the hill. Uh, they had to look for a place to sleep, and they found one sleeping on the hay in a manger. And God chose that place for his son to be born. And I've always wondered at that, the fact that it was like God was showing us that Jesus was for the common man and everyone. Now later on, you know the story, there, they have a visit a, a little while later from three other men, the, the wise men, remember? And those men were rich and very prosperous and brought wonderful gifts to the child. And so we run the gamut. We see that Jesus was born amongst common men. And yet, even the rich and famous, as we sometimes say, came to see him and pay homage to him. And so we see this child, the Son of God, that God <coughs> sent to us, has a very specific purpose for us. God wanted to be able to relate to you and I and everyone else about the salvation and the eternity that he offered to everyone. Now, sometimes it's a little misunderstanding when we think of eternity. Some people think that only Christians live for eternity. That's not what the Bible teaches. Everybody lives for eternity. Amen. The issue is, where are you going to spend your eternity? If you receive Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says you'll spend eternity in heaven with God and the angels. But if you choose to ignore and push away the truth of God and the offer of salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ, the Bible also very clearly says that your eternity will be spent in hell with the devil and his angels. And so, Eternity is something that's there for all of us. It's just a matter of decisions we make and where we choose to spend our eternity. Now, as we move on for a moment into 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I just want to read one little verse before we start. Paul is writing to the Corinthians, the church in Corinth, and he's telling them about how to do the Lord's <coughs> how to come together and celebrate the Supper of the Lord in this unique way. And in chapter 11, verse 23, he starts off and he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he, betray he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, 
which is for you. Do this, and I want you to focus on this phrase. Do this in remembrance of me. Amen. Now, we come together to remember Jesus often. I mean, that's what Sunday worship is all about, to remember and worship and praise and acknowledge our Lord Jesus Christ. We've been remembering him during Advent in these special ways. Everything in the Christian faith is about remembering Jesus because we were told in Scripture that the way to God's heart, the way to salvation, the way to heaven is through Jesus. Amen. And so this, when Paul tells them that this supper is for the purpose of remembering Jesus, they understood that. And the interesting thing is, is that this morning, we've been remembering Jesus at his birth. But between his birth and this last supper that Paul is tell telling us about, that Jesus shared with his apostles, there was approximately 33 years between those two events. And the Bible tells us that during those years, Jesus performed many miracles, healing the lame, as Daniel just sang up here uh, a moment ago, the deaf will hear, the blind will see, the dumb will talk, and even the dead will raise and walk again. And Jesus performed many miracles through these years, and we, we preach them and study them, and we remember those things. And then, of course, we also remember that day that he was taken to Golgotha, and hung there, nailed to a cross. And that was where the finality of God's promise was explained to all of us because we understood his birth, we understood his life, and now we were seeing his death. And many of the people did not understand what was happening. They said, wait, wait, he's the king, he's supposed to lead us into heaven. They didn't understand that there must be a price for sin. The Bible teaches in the Old Testament that when you sin, you must die. There must be a death for sin. That's why in the temple, in the ancient temple, they used to offer an animal sacrifice as a demonstration of death to sin. And they would take a lamb or a goat or some animal, and they would kill the animal and place it on an altar and burn it there to offer a sacrifice, showing God in symbolism that we understand that there must be a death for our sin. And you know the high priest, before the goat was offered, he would lay his hands on the head of the goat and pray for the sins of Israel. And then when that goat was sacrificed, he was dying for all of those sins. It was symbolic of what would happen when Jesus hung on the cross at Golgotha. Do you remember when he came to be baptized by John the Baptist, what John the Baptist said? Behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. Because John the Baptist